so hello and welcome everybody to the 2020 Earth Science Information Partners Summer Meeting Highlights webinar. My name is Megan Carter. I'm the Community Director of ESIP. And of course, this webinar is to highlight key events of the meeting from many different perspectives. So that whether you weren't able to be there or you're looking to learn more about what happened in some different breakout sessions, this webinar is for you. Um, we invite you to get involved in any of the efforts you see highlighted here, and I hope that by the end of this webinar, you'll be inspired to do so. This webinar, as I mentioned, is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel um, following the meeting. So ESIP hosts ESIP meetings like the one you'll hear about today in order to connect and create collaborative opportunities for individuals and organizations who work across sectors and across the data life cycle. The goal is to help you all work together and leverage each other's collective expertise to make progress on common data challenges and opportunities, and ultimately to make earth science data more discoverable, accessible, and useful to researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and the public. The theme for ESIP this year and the theme of the summer meeting is putting data to work which sums up the themes from the last five years. This theme helps us both to showcase the interesting ways that earth science data is being used, and it also encompasses how public-private partnerships are fostered and how they too can help to increase the resilience and enhance the socioeconomic value of data. For this meeting, we leveraged many of the same tools we have used in the past, including Sketch, the ESIP Big Share repository, and Google Suite. ESIP staff, led by Aaron Robinson, really dove in to identify a couple of critical additions that enable us to best take advantage of our time together virtually. In addition, session leaders and participants were offered numerous training sessions, and many of them, many of you all, took advantage of those to learn about the new tools and to take your sessions to the next level. To call out just a couple of those tools briefly, Kiko Chat was an application that provided a more seamless online meeting experience, allowing attendees to go from the plenary to an ESIP breakout session as you might walk from room to room at a physical conference center or meet with a small group of colleagues in the hallway or around a poster during the research showcase. This allowed attendees the autonomy to be where they wanted to be and enabled participants to see where others were to enhance the sense that we were together at the meeting. For the meeting, we also used Zoom as our primary teleconferencing software. This enabled breakouts within sessions and the ability to better mimic the small group work that often happens at ESIP meetings. It also provided a way for small groups to meet and convene even within the very large plenary sessions. This time around, we also provided collaborative notes documents for each session, and these remain an excellent record of what happened in many of the sessions. I'll tell you in a moment how you can access those. So we've asked presenters to contribute their presentations and posters to the ESIP FigShare portal as in past years. You can use this URL on the bottom left-hand corner to access the summer meeting content that's been contributed thus far. From there, you can filter to show, for example, just the posters. And sorry, I said bottom right, right? Yes. You can also find and access content at the Sketch site. You can find the session that you're interested in, click on it, and from there, you can see the description, the notes and presentations, a few key take takeaways from each session, and a link to the recording. Of course, it's not too late to deposit your presentations in Figshare, and we highly recommend that you do so. All breakout and plenary session recordings can be found on the ESIP YouTube channel in the 2020 ESIP Summer Meeting playlist. So we're very excited to have you all head over there and check, check the full length uh, recordings out. So next I'm going to hand it over to ESIP's outgoing Executive Director, Erin Robinson, who's going to share some more stats about the meeting. Thanks so much, Megan. Next slide. So the ESIP meeting by the numbers really blew us away. Um, it was the largest meeting that we've ever had with 512 attendees and 196 first time attendees, as well as many international attendees. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, and I think one interesting thing to note is that our ratio of first time attendees to returners was still pretty much how we um, have seen it in past in-person meetings. And just for reference, our in-person meeting 
the largest in-person meeting that we had 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 330 registered attendees. So we were really, I think, overwhelmed by the um, interest. And I think that one of the nice things about remote meetings was the ability for people who wouldn't have been able to attend otherwise to engage with us. Um, as Megan mentioned, we had 39 contributions to the research showcase. We had 60 sessions and 168 speakers. And I also want to say how much we appreciate the intention and the time that our speakers and our session conveners put into transitioning their in-person content into the virtual space. Next slide. So this is our first virtual group photo, photo and it's a little bit tongue in cheek, but this is one way that Kiko Chat let us see who was there. Um, and I think what I hope is that over time as we continue to have remote meetings that we'll build out these profiles and that this will become a rich kind of visual of the community. Next slide. So this gives you a sense of our global attendance. Um, Obviously, there was a lot of U.S. attendance, but what we didn't know that we had were people in Saudi Arabia, people in Brazil and South Africa. We knew that we had an Australian contingent um, that had been participating, but it was really nice to finally bring all of that together um, and particularly in, um, engage with some of our European um, colleagues that we don't always see at U.S. meetings. Next slide. So this also, we ask about ESIP areas of interest, and um, just to give you a sense of the top five areas of interest, um, cloud computing, the community data, data stewardship, data analytics, and the information technology and interoperability areas were of greatest interest, but you can also see the wide breadth of topics that ESIP covers and the interest that the community has. Next slide. And then finally, I just want to show a little bit about what we saw of attendance over time. So Tuesday morning of the first week was our highest attended um, plenary session. And then we saw a taper over the um, all of week one. And then in week two, we saw a taper again. But what I thought was really kind of interesting and, and wonderful was that Funding Friday had about 85 people at our peak, um, which is about what we would have in real life too. So I appreciated people who stuck with the meeting through the entire two weeks. Um, and I also think it was just interesting to see how people tried to fit the meeting content into the rest of their work and real lives. So with that, thank you so much, Megan, for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Erin. And one particularly exciting feature of the meeting was the introduction of ESIP's incoming executive director, Susan Shingledecker. We thought it would be great to have Susan introduce herself here on this webinar and share a few plenary, plenary highlights from her perspective. So welcome, Susan. Thank you. I thought I would turn on my camera and make it a little more person, personal and have kind of a conversation with you. I am so thrilled to be here, so thrilled to start my time with ESIP, and I'm really excited to be your new um, incoming executive director. I'm really grateful to Erin and to Megan, Annie, and the entire board for the thoughtful um, and thorough transition process that we have planned. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about me. Um, I know some of you have met me, some of you have not. Um, so I, I grew up on the Great Lakes. I grew up um, in very Western New York State and, and really had a connection with nature and the outdoors from a very young age. Um, I also, growing up in that area, happened to grow up about 10 miles from Love Canal. Um, and at the time, as a kid in the 80s, uh, I didn't realize that was really anything special. Um, there was this strange area that was the size of a football field that was fenced off, and there were block after block of boarded up houses. Um, and so growing up as a kid, I, I did develop this connection with nature um, that, that fueled a, a curiosity in, in me. Um, but I also had this connection to environmental injustice that kind of grew as I went to college and I learned more and more about what actually had happened in my own backyard practically. Um, and so those two things together have combined um, and have brought me to an over 20 year career in environmental issues, environmental management and nonprofit management, which positions me to be where I am today with you all here at ESIP. Um, I started my career in consulting um, so I've worked on a broad range of issues um, nation nationally and internationally. Um, I then worked for the National Governors Association and helped state level environmental issues for a number of, uh, a number of years. Um, and then moved on to the state of Maryland um, where I worked on energy issues for the state 
and climate change issues in a time when states were really having to take the lead on climate change. Um, from there, I actually moved more into a private sector role, working with the outdoor industry um, and actually with um, GEICO and Boat US, and really learned how to use data um, to manage an organization. Um, and so I think that's one thing that I bring to ESIP is an organization that's really focused on data externally. Well, how can we use data internally to be the best organization that we can be? Um, and then most recently, I was Vice President of Chesapeake Conservancy, a regional organization here based in Maryland, um, but working throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And we had a team of 12 GIS um, analysts and a data scientist who um, really used precision data to help um, pinpoint resource investments and restoration needs in the watershed. So that brings me to you here, and I'm really excited to be here and to be um, leading ESA forward. And I think that the summer meeting was the perfect place for me to start. Um, I was thrilled to just dive in and see the breadth of content um, available in this community and, and start to meet um, some of the wonderful people here. Um, I will say generally, I left the summer meeting with more questions than answers, which I think is a great thing because I'm a very curious person and I'm really excited to be part of this community that is excited to roll up their sleeves and tackle big challenges. Um, and I'm looking forward to getting to know you all. Um, I was asked to give a few highlights of the plenaries. So uh, next slide. And the next one. <laughs> so for plenary highlights, we started off week one um, with our Raskin scholar, Jacqueline Goods, and with Danielle Wood on Tuesday. And this session really, um, it excited me to see us showcasing the work of your early career professionals um, in, in Jacqueline's presentation. And Danielle left me with one of my mo one of the quotes that most um, uh, inspired me and was just an eye-opening moment for me, um, where she said that advancing justice is enabled by space. And you know, I, I come to this meeting as a, as a, as a first-time attendee, and that just kind of blew my mind when I thought about all of the work and all of the movement that's been happening on justice in the, in the most recent months um, and how that is connected to Earth observations in space. Um, and so I was just really excited by that. I wanted to point out that quote um, that just had me really excited. Um, from there, we moved on to Thursday to Shell Gentleman's um, presentation and Julia's presentations on um, empowering the efficiency of open science and, and looking at what is possible there. Next slide. Um, in week two on Tuesday, we had the, the fantastic USGO Town Hall with Martin and Lawrence and Timothy. Um, and I really found their section, their, their presentations really great. Um, I, I took some notes about how, how do we make sure that national is beyond federal? Um, how do we engage with the private sector and get a broader range of sectors growing and using earth science data to drive demand? Um, and the importance of stories to connect data to impact. Um, and that really left me with a, with a really big challenge about the, the possibilities for this community moving forward. Um, I was really excited about those conversations. And then Thursday, we finished off um, with Leslie Ann and Dan Morris's presentations. Um, and I really, um, I really, one, I, I get excited about the, the hope that we could be all gathered together in Vermont next year. Um, and I really uh, enjoyed Dan's, Dan's highlighting a lot of his AI for Earth grantees work. Um, Leslie Ann's question of, she was asked about as the Vermont state climatologist, you know, how do you, how do you bring the people together for these comprehensive solutions? And she had said that, you know, one of the things she says at every meeting that she goes to is, thank you for coming and who is missing? And I can't help but think that's what I think of when I look at this ESIP community. Thank you so much to all of you who are here and who do we need to have in the room next time? Um, and so that's my challenge to all of you as we move forward. Um, and then also wrapping up the, the plenary highlights was an amazing interactive discussion on our strategic themes looking forward. And I invite any and all of you to reach out to me um, on those topics. It was also, I thought, a great exercise in interactivity and online meetings in how we had all of these people in different breakouts, adding ideas to collaborative documents all in real time. And I just thought it was a really rich way to connect, to gather information. And it really shows, uh, I, I believe, a really unique feature of this community. And those are my plenary highlights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. All right. so. Uh, now for the breakout session highlight, highlights. Most of you already know this, but these will be a series of 
two minute highlights and we're going to keep strict time. So speakers, if you hear a timer going off, it's going to be run by Aaron. Um, that means your time is up and you should please um, stop. If one speaker is highlighting more than one session, they'll have two minutes for each session. I've asked each presenter to provide information on how to learn more and how to get involved. So even though these are brief reports, we hope they'll be kind of the seed of what you need to figure out where you want to jump in. If you have questions, we have a collaborative Google Doc that will be shared in the chat. Um, and this will be a great way for you to leave questions for any and all of the presenters, and it'll give presenters a way to respond. Um, even if we don't have time to, to discuss all the questions at the end of the webinar, it'll keep a good record and you all can kind of be having a conversation as the webinar is going on. So please definitely open that up um, and contribute to it if you feel inspired to do so. So we will kick it off now with our very first speaker, and that will be Ned Mulder, who will highlight the public-private partnership session. So Ned, when you're ready, feel free to unmute and start. Okay, great, thanks. So yeah, I'm Ned Mulder. I'm a social scientist student contractor with the USGS uh, based in Fort Collins, Colorado. So our session started with a quick survey of participants to gather information on their interests and experiences with public-private partnerships, or P3s. Um, then we had four speakers present on their experiences from the public and the private sectors um, in Earth Observation P3s. So first we had Tim Stryker, who's the Acting Associate Program Coordinator and Chief of the Outreach and Collaboration Branch at the USGS National Land Imaging Program. Next we had Amanda Reagan, who is the head of the PhiLab Invest Office and Program Manager of the Investment in Industrial Innovation, or INCUBED, Earth Observation Program uh, out, out of ISA Esrin in Italy. Third, we had Eva Haas, who is the head of Geoville's Agriculture Department and project manager of the EO Plugin uh, program with ESA Esrin. And this is actually the first activity co-funded within the Incubed program. Um, and lastly, we had Anamika Das, who is the vice president for professional geospatial markets at Geospatial Media and Communications. Um, and she shared with us some insights from her 20 years of market research and experience uh, in the geospatial industry. Um, so, we shared some insights from this Slido uh, questionnaire at the beginning, um, which is where we got these three takeaways. So um, there's a number of past and current EOP3s to build a list of leading practices. Um, second, definitions of P3s vary, but there are similarities between them. Um, and thirdly, external communication uh, to the public about partnerships, um, partnership procure procurement, and maintenance of open data were all strong topics identified um, by our participants. So if you want to learn more or join our cluster, um, feel free to contact either Krista Straub or Carl Shapiro um, or join our mailing list at that link uh, down at the bottom. Um, and that's it. Thank you. That was excellent timing. Thank you very Perfect. much. Moving on, we will have Tom Paris discussing the open source environment security analytics session. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. So we had a great session. Uh, talking about environment and security, and in the theme of ESIP, we view this as a broad enterprise. Um, it's one that's, that really spans um, not only all of the earth sciences, but brings in social sciences and international relations and um, lots of other disciplines that aren't traditionally associated with earth science data. Um, we, uh, 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 we spent some time defining environment security, what it means, uh, what some of the frameworks are for environment security. Uh, we talked about the needs for, uh, and, uh, as part of the enterprise, we, we need an open source uh, community that works with public partnerships. And we had speakers uh, from my sciences, me, representing a small company uh, from Columbia University, Bob Chen, uh, representing academia, and uh, Mark Wall from the Army Corps of Engineers representing government. And uh, there really is a lot of back and forth through the open source community of tools, data, methods, uh, uh, and, and approaches. Um, and while many of the practitioners in the environment security arena uh, are uh, hidden, um, the, the availability of, of these open source tools and analytics not only makes their job easier, but improves their uh, skill in doing their job. Um, we then had a second session um, 
where we took a deep dive into some tools that are being developed on, a, uh, on an effort we call Dante uh, Data and Analytic Tools for Eco Security. Um, and uh, we had a, a deep dive into what the core is doing, deep dive into some of the tools of the replication tools in Dante, uh, and then some of the specific data sets and tools that are being developed as well. Uh, good session, and you see our contact information and where you can go for additional information. Thank you very much, Tom. Moving on now to Chris Linus and the data discovery, usage driven data discovery hack fest. Uh, thanks, Megan. So we had uh, three sessions for this uh, hack fest that were spread out over the two weeks. We're working on usage based discovery, which is finding a data sets by how they're used. So it's kind of asking the question, you know, what data sets does the Dartmouth Flood Observatory use for flood mapping? That's what the use of discovery is currently working on. And we're using a graph database approach because it's a natural for this. So the HackFest goal was to develop proof of concepts. We had three teams, one group working on code, one working on designing the user experience, and one just out foraging the data set uh, relationships. Uh, next slide, please. So here were the results. Uh, what did we get? Well, we got three prototypes from the coder, which was pretty remarkable. Um, we got some design mock-up from the UX design. You can actually see two of the code uh, snapshots, by the way, on the top there, one from Beth Huffer, one from my uh, summer intern, Maggie Zhu. Um, and the foragers found several data set use relationships. So the outcome was we think this could work. Uh, the designers learned that you really need to focus on the data wranglers that work on putting the data together with the application for end users more so than the end users themselves. And foragers discovered that we need much better data citation practices in the applications field the way we have them in research. So now what? Well, we're going to evolve some of that code, see if we can make it scale, find some more data set relationships. And for the rest of it, we're going to talk about that at next week's cluster meeting uh, at roughly the same time. So if you're interested, uh, contact me and uh, we can sign you up to help work on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to Renee Brown and recent advances in environmental sensing for monitoring and research. Thanks, Megan. Good afternoon, everybody. We had a great session that was sponsored by the Enviro Sensing Cluster, where we had a series of short 10 minute talks. We had five um, speakers that were mostly focused on um, applications of low cost, low power, and or open source. Um, hardware for doing research and monitoring. Um, so I encourage everybody to go check those out on YouTube. And we also had some, a uh, couple of community discussion about virtual hands-on workshops. Um, right now we, we would love to do a hands-on workshop, but um, in the time of COVID, we can't, uh, our only option is to do that virtually. There's a lot of interest in that. And so that's one of the areas that the clusters are going to be focused on going forward, um, maybe in conjunction with the ESIP winter meeting, we can do one of these workshops. Um, so in order to learn more, visit our, our wiki page. Our mailing list is there. We encourage um, anybody who's interested in environmental sensor networks to join us. Um, we have monthly calls the first Tuesday of the month at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, we often have speakers that come in and talk about their work, but we also have open discussion as well. And uh, our emails are there as well. So we hope to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Renee. And a, a quick uh, report out from this side. I do see a couple of questions in our collaborative document, so keep it coming, everybody. Uh, moving on now, we'll have Bill Tang discussing the community concept mapping for data dis to decisions session. Uh, Megan, I think you're showing my slide. Apologies. Sorry, everyone. Uh, building technical know how through innovation and seed funding. Leslie, please take it away. Thank you, Megan. During this session, Annie Burgess and I led a discussion about the ESIP Lab and USGS Community for Integration Seed Funding Processes, how to participate and lessons learned. 
The two main points that we presented for optimizing proposal processes like these are on the slide in the speech bubbles. So integrate a learning objective into your project and use the community. We had interactive activities to share our technical knowledge. So we networked to share some life and work hacks and aspirations for technical skills to learn. And we also invited some current funded project investigators from our two programs to share how they learned about a technical solution they learned during the course of their project. Takeaways are to use innovation seed funding to improve processes and workflows and reduce reinvention of the wheel. Um, please use the safe and non-competitive places like CDI and ESIP so that you can brainstorm and ask questions while experimenting with new technology implementations. And we realized that time invested into learning a new skill seems like it might slow you down in the short term, but it has long-term benefits. So if you want to learn more about ESIP Lab or CDI, you can follow the links that I will put into the chat and the shared doc. Thanks. Thank you very much, Leslie, and sorry for the confusion, everyone. So next up, we will actually welcome uh, Bill to talk about the community concept mapping for data to decision session. Thank you, Megan. Can you hear me? Just want to make sure. OK, great. Hello, everyone. Uh, the agriculture and climate cluster session uh, was on the use of community concept mapping to trace data to decisions uh, or decisions to data. Uh, on community because concept maps are very useful to engender a common understanding of whatever is the subject of interest, in our case, uh, transdisciplinary social environmental challenges. Uh, for example, one of our current focus areas is on the post-wildfire emergency response, and we had an invited speaker on that topic in the session, Catherine Rowden from the National Weather Service. But a concept map is a way to organize and model knowledge that shows ideas and information the concepts and the relationships between the concepts. The figure on the right shows a concept map for wildfire prevention that traces from policy to data, uh, landside data in, in this case. Uh, the main takeaway, number one, the concept maps are useful to engage with others, to communicate knowledge and to educate, particularly across silos. And number two, concept maps are thus useful to facilitate transdisciplinary collaborations, both among each of groups and those external to ESA. So what's next? Uh, our roadmap from here towards the 2021 winter meeting is one to continue the populating of the concept map soup, which is where we need community help, uh, your help. Uh, we envision this concept map soup to possibly eventually be an ESA resource for discovery algorithms. And number two, to align our roadmap with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, starting with food security, uh, number, which is number two goal, and disasters. For more information, our emails are at the lower left, and you can subscribe to the cluster mailing list at the lower right. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and thank you to all the presenters who really are um, sticking to time. Um, there's so much to talk about here. So I will stop talking and hand it over to Nancy Hobel Heinrich to talk about the ESIP contributions to the FAIR Convergence Matrix Workshop. Great, thank you, Megan. Yes, yeah, so, so so this was a two-part workshop. The first part was designed to be more interactive, and the second part was had a few more presentations, but also a chance to work on some tools that uh, we one, that we presented about. the The main goal of the session, as you can see, was to apprise people of how it's how uh, some organizations in Europe and of, in, in conjunction with those in the U.S. are trying to move beyond the discussion of FAIR data principles to implementing FAIR by introducing a number of services and tools that they uh, that are being created and are being, starting to be used. So the first session, the first part of the session was the first workshop part of the workshop was to find out what people knew about FAIR, each of the FAIR data principles and what whether there was confusion or, or um, misunderstanding about what it meant to implement each of those. Those, those were very interesting. We've got the notes of those, uh, those sessions in the, the documents that uh, Megan represented before, or presented before. And then the second session was to talk more about those tools. So we had a couple of presenters, including um, Eric Schultes, who is from the Go Fair project in the uh, in the Netherlands, housed in the Netherlands, they have got their that's the organization that's kind of leading the uh, implementation work 
including the different tools that they're using and the different directories that they're using for sharing uh, different uh, standards and uh, implementation profiles, fair implementation profiles that people are creating with, which is declaring their decisions about uh, what they're doing to implement fair. We also had Jillian Schneider then from Harvard, who has created a, a, a FIP, a fair implementation profile, which will go into that convergence matrix of all kinds of FIPs that are being created. I had one, and then uh, we also had Christine Kirkpatrick from GoFair USA uh, talk about what the plans were to uh, to move this whole movement forward to implement FAIR. So you can see what the takeaways are there, people see the value of understand, of knowing what other people are doing, the GoFAIR tools and services could be very helpful to ESIP in implementing FAIR, and then uh, it, there seem to be a consensus that ESIP partners should contribute more to that, to those tools and to the directories and so on. So if you want to learn more, you can contact me. Uh, we also had Melissa uh, Cragen and Kristen Kirkpatrick from GoFAIR USA to jo joining uh, and they can be contacted as well. And then you can also find more about the whole approach, the whole framework at that URL down below. Also, we're working this through the ESIP uh, Data Stewardship Committee as well. So that's it. Thank you, Nancy. So next up we have one of the, what I found was one of the most exciting sessions at the summer meeting on what we wished we had learned in grad school. And this was led by a group of ESIP community fellows, including Ben Roberts Purell, who will give the report out today. Thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, so as Megan mentioned, this was kind of born out of the experience of myself, um, Ellie Davis, Purell, and Yuhan Rao, all community fellows, um, and sort of what we found to be a lack of um, data management training in our graduate school experiences. And um, this is not at all to uh, sort of put down the plethora of resources that are out there, but the objective of our session was to kind of work on a, a cheat sheet, like a, a soft intro to data management, um, specifically tailored towards the experience of graduate students um, and sort of mapped onto the graduate school experience. Um, and so we gave a short presentation followed by a series of breakout sessions um, where we solicited input from the community um, based on a data life cycle that we used from data one. Um, and so this is an ongoing process, but a couple of quick takeaways. Uh, it was There was a consensus that this should start early in the grad student's career. So that's something that people are thinking about from the get-go. Um, best to integrate into existing curricula and requirements. Um, there was a lot of discussion around uh, sort of pushback on adding classes or um, adding a burden to um, existing curricula or other uh, advisors' um, responsibilities. Um, and then there was a lot of discussion around where to host such a thing and then how best to disseminate to reach the right audiences. Um, there was a lot of discussion around Twitter as a tool for trying to reach people in the scientific community. Um, and so that's kind of going to be a question that we'll address going forward. Uh, Ellie, Yuhan, and myself are working on this uh, through the fall. Um, so if people are interested, um, we'll be sending out an email to the folks who are involved in the session uh, in the next few weeks as we make progress on this project. Um, but if you're interested or have other questions, feel free to contact me in my email down in the corner there. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ben. Moving on to another extremely important topic, connecting informatics to science communities. Welcome, Ed Armstrong. Okay, hello everyone. This is a nice segue uh, to the um, report you just talked. Um, so this is connecting informatics to science communities, and I'm. I'm uh, presenting on behalf of uh, Jessica Hausman, um, who's off on travel right now. And so we, we were looking at uh, how informatics is playing an increasingly important factor in effective data collection, creation, and scientific research. I think we recognize that is uh, still kind of an ongoing, even building issue. And this session looked at this landscape from a number of different aspects. Um, and the future for data uh, users and providers um, using nine breakout groups. Um, and so the presentation is focused on, it had a little bit of an oceanography bent to it. Um, it. It brought out some of the findings from a recent Ocean OBS um, 2019 conference <laughs> that is looking at the horizon of in situ oceanography for the next 10 years. 
and the data management component of that, as, as well as work ongoing work that's uh, going in CIOS um, within um, ESIP itself and uh, within hackathons. So um, from the nine breakout groups, um, uh, the various different uh, um, takeaways um, that we, we came is, is again, um, uh, you know, kind of supporting the on, uh, leveraging the help desk, which is, uh, you know, kind of a recent activity that ESIP has been undertaking uh, things like the AGU data fairs that allow opportunities to engage data users. And really if in the future, if we could like match users um, and problems with experts, as well as develop mini presentations on kind of the tools and services aspect to solve specific problems. And of course, hackathons are another avenue um, for making this uh, connection and bridging um, scientists with users. And building on the theme of the earlier um, slide set, uh, you know, starting data management and informatics early, whether it's in a career of a researcher or with, uh, within a new mission or campaign or a new instrument or a new data set, it really has to start at the beginning. If it happens at the end of the chain, uh, the problems become exceedingly more difficult. And one of the things I took away is that from the solution space, really building analogies to simplify complex problems and then reusing them from other disciplines or communities um, would be good. And we plan to promulgate these ideas in the marine data cluster uh, for now. Okay, I think I'm up with my two minutes there. So thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, this wasn't in the agenda, but I've decided to add a challenge to you all to try to add at least one question or comment to the document that Susan has been sharing in the in the chat box um, for any session that you'd like. Um, and I will try to pause a little bit more in between each one of these so that you have a chance to get your, get your thought out. So next up, I would like to welcome Mark Parsons to discuss the assigning credit for research artifacts session. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Um, hello, all everybody. Um, so citation is a reference to something for the purpose of credit attribution and facilitation of access. So this cluster examines how this can be done for a variety of different research artifacts, you know, not just articles or data, but software, ontologies, samples, et cetera. Noting that these different concerns of reference, access, credit, and even things like tracking impact and provenance often require different approaches. So we've been looking at these different concerns for these different artifacts for some time now. And at the winter meeting, we looked at, reproduci at the reproducibility use case. Um, and here at the summer meeting, we look specifically at credit. And we broke into groups for different artifacts and tried to see if there's the, if this existing taxonomy for co contributor roles, so-called the credit taxonomy, could apply to these artifacts. And basically our takeaway was that Defining what you want to credit is really essential, and that can be particularly tricky, um, especially for models. Model is a very vague term, it turns out. Um, this taxonomy may not really apply well for these different sorts of artifacts. It was originally designed for papers. It may not, we, maybe we need to consider making a new one. We need to at least consider others. Um, and then finally, really the big takeaway is that the credit use case is much harder than the re reproducibility case. Um, people are much more difficult than computers. And I sort of tried to convey that with my little uh, logos there to the right, that we don't even really know what credit means. Is it, you know, is it certification? Is it recognition? Is it an award? Um, is it, you know, being on top? You know, the, 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 all these still needs to be worked out. So we would love to have you all be involved. We meet again next week on Thursday at noon Eastern. Um, so join the cluster and find out more. My Perfect timing. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I would like to report that the document, if you're not looking at it, it's um, almost blowing up. So thank you all for heading over there and, and keep it up. I will now mosey on to the next slide. I would like to welcome Leslie Wyborn to discuss proliferation of vocabularies in solid earth, space, and environmental sciences. Which one should I choose and which ones can I trust? Um, okay, good morning, everyone. It's 5.30 here. Um, this is a problem we've got in Australia with the Australian Research Data Commons. We run a vocabulary service and the vocabs are just proliferating. We're getting pestered by the users. Which one should I use? How do I know which one to trust? 
And so Simon Cox and I thought, well, why don't we throw this um, pebble in the pond of ESIP and see whether people are also starting to come and grapple with this. And it seems like, yes, it is a bit of an issue and it's an elephant in the room. And we need to try and work out ways to avoid unintended duplication of the vocabs, but not just within ESIP, but also external to ESIP. And so within ESIP, it was sort of hard to know which one of all the clusters were touching on some of the vocabulary issues. And secondly, as Nancy has already alluded to, for those of us who work internationally, there are equivalent efforts going on, like for example, in particular, fair sharing. And so uh, Ruth has agreed to be the contact person, but what we're actually saying is that um, how do we firstly map within ESIP, but then secondly, start to work out how we connect to some of the others and actually be quite frank and say, well, does some of these other international efforts replace what we're doing within ESIP? And if we go the international route, then we've got broader um, range, but the jury's out. There were six breakout sessions and I've put in the questions the link to where the notes are and you can see the summary of all the breakout sessions there. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you so much for waking up early for us once again. Uh, we'll move on next. <laughs> we will move on next to uh, a related session, Margaret O'Brien discussing drafting guidelines for vocabulary selection. Margaret? Uh, hi, I think I unmuted. Yes. Hi, this is related to a Leslie session that she just spoke about. And so our goal is actually to start to begin drafting guidelines uh, for users that want to use vocabularies. How do they choose? Um, so this session collected some materials to begin that draft. <clears throat> Excuse me, we used some crowdsourcing uh, where participants entered information about the vocabularies they already use and then some uh, synthesis sessions and breakouts and plenary. Um, so the, take the three takeaways from this was for, yes, definitely the community is using many different vocabularies. These have varying quality and are somewhat incompatible. Uh, these vocabularies need a higher level of coordination as Leslie's session has already addressed. Uh, secondly, the community is looking for a coordinated directory or a catalog of vocabularies. And they also need to understand how uh, the management procedures and governance models of these work. Uh, to, as part of their decision making. So we could start by comparing catalogs that already exist like the uh, OBO Foundry and the Australian uh, NEII uh, directories. And the third one is we, have, we need some targeted middleware for potential users to help them understand and navigate and use these vocabularies. And this could also help them contribute, um, uh, say by uh, providing new terms, um, or vetting terms that already exist. Uh, so we're going to be working with the related session, the one that Leslie just spoke about, to develop a guideline stock. And to participate, you can contact me directly um, to work on the vocabulary use guidelines, or you can join the semantic harmonization cluster to work on vocabulary alignment. Thank you, Margaret. All right, so next up we have another exemplary ESIP community fellow, Yuhan Rao, who's actually going to highlight two sessions, two machine learning sessions for us. So Yuhan, when you're ready, take it away. Thanks, Megan. So the summer meeting has uh, marked the, the beginning of the third year for machine learning cluster. And uh, we have done a lot of work in the past two years and we have been thinking about what we can do for the next a year or two. And so what we have been uh, proposing for the summer meeting is that there are a lot of emerging uh, organizational strategy and plans to uh, utilize machine learning for earth science uh, communities. So we have brought a, uh, together a group of uh, five uh, representatives from uh, USGS, from um, NOAA, as, uh, that's two uh, government agencies, and also an applied science program from NASA, which is the um, Harvest Project. And the other two industry partners, one is the Element 84, as well as the Microsoft AI for Earth. So we have really engaged in discussion among those five representatives on how the ESIP community and the machine learning cluster can assist to accelerate the adoption of machine learning for earth science community. 
So what we have seen in this discussion is that there is an increasing need for machine learning ready data for earth sciences, but we are not quite sure what that means for the data yet. So there have been proposal for like maturity level criteria for both the data and machine learning models that are needed. And ESIP has been a really good platform to um, facilitate this type of cross-agency best practices for curating the machine learning ready data to ensure the interoperability as well as the application of machine learning for earth science. And with that, we come to the uh, tutorial and training. So we have a lot of like demand for the training as well. And so that also helps us to chart our next step for the machine learning cluster. The first step is to uh, talking about what's the best practices and what's the recommendation for machine learning ready data for earth sciences. And the second step is to creating um, useful and uh, earth science oriented uh, machine learning tutorials to engage more workforce uh, in the community to utilize machine learning. Megan, can you go to the next slide? And in the past year, supported by the Funding Friday from 2019 summer meeting, that we have been working uh, in the cluster to create uh, some earth science specific tutorials using open science, uh, open source data as well as the open source software. So uh, in the summer meeting, we uh, debuted our uh, machine learning tutorial that's focused on machine learning, uh, earth science data. Uh, right, right now in the market, there are a lot of tutorials for computer scientists and other fields like using the machine learning to distinguish both cats and dogs. But this is great, but for earth science that we have some unique feature for earth science data. So what we have been trying to do is to use the, um, to use earth science data and to create this type of machine learning tutorials just for earth science community, for ESIP community. And we have heard a lot of need and demand for this type of tutorials and for machine learning in the ESIP community. And we are planning to expand this machine learning tutorials through the co-development with other clusters and, and, and also with the users and data providers. And I had a pro, uh, follow up with um, Annie and talk about potential ideas to challenge the community to come up with like more tutorials that we can uh, contribute all together through ESIP and the machine learning class, uh, cluster. So um, that leads to me have more follow up to do with other clusters as well as the data providers to for the next steps. And thank you. Thank you very much, Johan. It's been exciting to see this all develop. Um, I'd like to move on now to the project planning and management workshop report out from Ward Flurry. Thanks, Megan. Um, Carl Benedict and I uh, presented uh, this workshop. Um, the objectives were to provide a foundation of project management concepts, uh, to provide instruction in the use of a pre -pro free project management planning tool, in this case, Project Libra, which is uh, available on a variety of operating systems. And finally, to give participants the opportunity to put concepts and the tool into practice with their own real life examples. Um, this workshop was designed to be in uh, three 90 minute sessions with time in between for participants to digest the content and put it into practice for their own example. Uh, I presented the project management concepts and Carl provided instruction on the use of Project Libra. Um, just briefly, in the first session, <clears throat> I covered uh, the basic concepts and definitions, um, project initiation, and then talked about planning, in particular the, uh, the scope and schedule portions. And then Carl introduced the Project Libra and the concept of doing a project exercise uh, for individuals, uh, participants. Uh, the second session, I uh, completed the planning discussion by talking about uh, doing a budget based on work breakdown structure, schedule, and the resources. Talked about project execution in terms of organizing and leading team members, and then monitoring and controlling with an emphasis on tracking schedule and costs and communication to stakeholders. Uh, Carl then showed more features of Project Libra, in particular adding people and, and equipment. Uh, the final session, I talked about project closeout and some other particular topics of procurement management and risk management. And then Carl finished up by demonstrating various analysis and visualization features of Project Libra. And if you have questions, you can contact either one of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ward.
a quick check on our notes document shows that you all have been busy asking questions and leaving comments. Thank you for doing that and keep it up again. All right, moving on to structured data on the web, putting best practice to work, Dave Blodgett. Hey, everybody. Um, so we had a, actually a series of three sessions um, brought together by a number of folks um, around ESIP. It was a great, um, great community of people. A big focus was to bring together kind of technologists as well as folks that are more applied. And this diagram on the right-hand side was our little engagement ploy at the beginning of our first session to get a sense for where everybody was at. And the, the real goal of the session was to drive everybody out to that um, kind of further further applied and or further technical depending where they're coming from um, and it went it went really well so the first the first session was a series of lightning talks um, that kind of got everybody thinking and that was a really nice summary of kind of where the where the uh, state of practice is on text structured data on the web um, the, we then had two breakouts um, talking about problems and opportunities in the first one and then more technical or achievable next steps in the second breakout um, and based on those breakouts, two kind of focus focus points emerged. Uh, one around handling of identifiers and structured data on the web, um, which is seems like it should be straightforward, but um, there aren't any real concrete guide, guidelines for exactly how to use identifiers, and it's pretty um, important that we get them in the right place. And then the second focus was around spatial features and real world objects and how we reference those real world entities and track them consistently in our in our data. Um, and the both groups kind of came up with the same basic outcome is we've got plenty of flexibility and ability to express what we need to, um, and in some ways too much because we we need some more kind of community established interoperable profiles of these tools that we now have to use. Um, and I think one of the big probably near-term goals for us is to start to look at defining some JSON schemas that wrap up some of the good work that's gone on in scienceonschema.org um, to, to kind of focus the community around. So join us on summit scienceonschema.org um, and we'll see you there. Thank you, Dave. Uh, speaking of schema.org, we have a report out um, which will be handled by Adam Shepard on advancing schema.org guidelines for data set interoperability and discovery. Hi friends, uh, the Science on Schema.org cluster held a session at ESIP Summer Meeting uh, to discuss some of the, the needs for Schema.org and discovering uh, social science data, uh, but also advancing the guidelines that we've put together um, as a cluster and some of the issues there. So just to, to back up a little bit, the Schema.org cluster is sort of taking standards and web publishing uh, from the harvesters such as Google and Yahoo and those big search engines and taking those techniques for describing the contents of web uh, website pages uh, to research data so that these data can be better found and discovered through these major search engines but also through other harvesting initiatives like Data One and so forth. Um, and so as part of those guidelines that we were working on, uh, we're tackling issues like how to describe variables uh, properly, the provenance relationships between data sets, um, and then also uh, what was released and discussed at the meeting was uh, this validation tool um, that Dave Vieglas developed that works right in the Chrome browser. And so if you've got a web page and you're trying to use science on schema.org guidelines to publish schema.org for your data sets, you can use this tool to validate how well it matched up against those guidelines. Uh, so yeah, so to find out more about what our group's doing or to get involved there, uh, you can visit scienceonschema.org right in the browser or contact myself or go to uh, the ESIP wiki and look for the schema.org cluster. Thank you, Adam. Um, very active cluster, uh, I will echo there. Um, all right, moving on next, we will talk with Peng, who's going to highlight challenges of consistently curating and representing fair data set quality information. This is a report out from a pre usage workshop. Hi, uh, my name is Go Peng, and uh, one of the IQC co-chairs. Uh, Monday, um, July 13, before uh, ESIP work meetings, we had a whole day workshop with two live sessions to um, develop, to kick off the development of uh, community guidelines to improve the sharing of quality 
quality of information of data and the metadata. So this uh, um, summer meeting session is to um, report out the outcomes and communicate to the community and as well as continue exploring the needs call, uh, challenge and existing approaches by the workshop and to uh, participate and also to facilitate open discussions among the ESIP community and the workshop participates and organizing committee members. Um, we had a very productive discussion and uh, a number of the key takeaways from the discussion are following. Uh, it has mentioned that community guidelines are very beneficial, but they should be developed through an iterated process with a, a feedback loop um, that can including funders and data producers, data users, and the data managers. And uh, uh, has mentioned that guidelines should be actionable and the long-term sustainability should be considered upfront. Um, so as we are starting the development of the guidelines and uh, we definitely would like to have the community to get involved and uh, to do so, uh, you can contact me and other IQC co-chairs as well as joining us um, on the website. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on, we will now speak with Bob Downs, who will discuss the citizen science data and information quality session. Thank, thank you very much, Megan. And uh, this session was also sponsored by the information quality cluster. Uh, Yak Sing Wei is the chair. Tampa uh, firm Rama Priyan, known as Rama, is our, our former co-chair. And other co-chairs are um, Gu Peng, who just spoke, David Moroni, and myself. And this session was collaboratively convened with the Citizen Science Association for Challenge 2020, as well as the Information Quality Cluster. And we focused on challenges and opportunities for improving documenting and encouraging the use and quality of citizen science data and services. The Citizen Science uh, Association is a membership organization that focuses on improving understanding about citizen science. The North Challenge 2020 is running a globally coordinated citizen science campaign. It's a partnership with the Wilson Center and the U.S. Department of State. Uh, Greg Newman spoke about uh, uh, the uh, role of patterns in improving citizen science data quality and reuse. And he represented the Colorado State University and the Citizen Science Association. And you see his graphic there. And Clay Herbo spoke uh, as well uh, as representing Ann Bowser, who were both from the Wilson Center and Earth Challenge 2020. They spoke about citizen science data integration and documentation, lessons learned, and opportunities. So we discussed developing a rubric for the evaluation of quality levels of citizen science data and general uh, research questions and how they might be pursued in a survey. And our three takeaways are a platform. Uh, needs to uh, is important role for citizen science workflow and increasing confidence in uh, citizen science data products we also need to improve documentation of quality throughout the all stages in citizen science projects uh, we discussed the survey we think that's a good idea uh, to identify data quality requirements of different types of users including decision makers intermediaries as well as researchers and uh, will this be helpful as well? Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Okay, next up we'll have another um, information quality proponent, Rama, who will be discussing exploring new perspectives and formulating best practices for data uncertainty information. Uh, yes, this was a session that was also organized by the Information Quality Cluster. And David Maroney, who has been uh, a proponent of uh, dealing with uncertainty as part of information quality, has been uh, uh, was the lead uh, for uh, for this two-part session. The first part we had uh, two speakers uh, shedding new light on uh, 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 uncertainty quantization perspectives on data modeling and assimilation. Uh, I should mention that uh, this, um, uh, this dealing with uncertainty information has been uh, on our minds for the last couple of years. 
And at the end of last year, we published a document uh, about uh, uh, looking at uh, different perspectives, different perspectives on uh, data uncertainty. And uh, the focus there was did not include data modeling and assimilation. So that's a new thing that we are talking about in this uh, in this session. Um, and then we had a second part of this session, which uh, had oops, which had many breakouts to dive deeper into the, into the perspectives and providing a foundation for the part two recommendations paper. Uh, the, the first part of recommendation paper, as I mentioned, was published last year, at the end of the end of last year. So the key takeaways from this session. So we should consider new use cases so that we can cover perspectives that we had not covered previously. And uh, we do need to uh, pay attention to the difference between spatio-temporal scales uh, in dealing with uh, in-situ airborne satellite and model disseminating data, because these are all these all cover different time scales and different spatial uh, uh, spatial resolutions and scales, global versus local, and so on. Uh, and uh, and we need to have discipline-independent open source tools to support algorithm developers to support uh, uncertainty quantization workflows and consistently representing the, in them in the data files. And having a common vocabulary will help as well. So we'll go on to the next slide, which is talking about uh, a different session that was also uh, in which also the IQC had a uh, had a finger, and this has to do with uh, standardizing the representation of uncertainty information in NetCDF. So uh, Ken Kehoe from uh, uh, oh, Oklahoma University, I believe, uh, is uh, leading a proposal for including uncertainty quantization in NetCDF CF uh, metadata, and uh, so he has been uh, he has developed a proposal where it has not quite gone to uh, being mature and being approved by the uh, CF group. So the purpose of this session was to discuss that proposal. Uh, so Ken Kehoe gave a summary, uh, a discussion of that proposal. And uh, we talked about the details. It was a uh, long, almost like an editing session uh, of that uh, brief. It's a fairly short proposal document that we're looking at uh, on the screen, on a shared screen, and uh, trying to edit, edit and ask questions and comment on them. So the takeaways from there were uh, specific technical terminology need to, need to be polished up. And we need some consensus on where to go with regard to using the uh, standard name modifier versus the actual standard name. This was a particular specific question that took a, lot, a fair amount of time during the meeting to discuss. And okay, uh, I think I'm done. Thank you, Rama, very much. Uh, we have just a few report outs left, so hang with us if you can and keep contributing to the document. Um, next up, we'll have Daniel Lee talking about CF conventions for NetCDF. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, yeah, this uh, segues quite well from the previous presentation, talking also about CF, NetCDF. And in fact, I've seen a lot of topics that really connect with uh, the CF conventions, a lot of stuff about analysis-ready data and data stewardship. And uh, this session was set up to talk about the CF conventions uh, which is really an enabler for all of these other interoperability and analytics issues. Uh, the standard is very widely adopted and uh, we're keen to keep it useful, uh, which is an exciting thing to attempt to do in such a dynamic environment. And so the purpose of this session was to connect with the community. Um, we recapped what had taken place at the recent community meeting and discussed ways to engage when you see uh, potential for change, potential for improvement, or needs for improvement, such as uh, the uncertainty proposal that was just under discussion. Uh, we also introduced a couple of major changes in how we're maintaining the conventions. Uh, something that's pretty exciting is that before the CF conventions were 
uh, basically uh, a pure text document which was quite easy to follow but a lot of material to read through and now we have a data model that has been published and peer-reviewed and it will be used to um, to measure up proposals in the future to make sure that they're consistent with the overall concept that we have and uh, this will make it easier to understand the conventions themselves to maintain them and to implement software to implement software around the standard um, some other exciting talks were about uh, how to interconnect CF with other vocabularies and ontologies. Uh, that is really exciting because it means that all the metadata work that goes into CF could be extended to incorporate vocabularies from other disciplines. Uh, I think that's really, really great work, but it's much too much to go into right now. So if you're interested in joining us, visit our website or come to our page on GitHub, and I put that in the discussion doc. Thank you. All right, moving on to a topic that is near and dear to my heart, uh, a session on a proposed ESIP cluster for physical samples. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks. Uh, so the purpose of this session was to discuss developing a physical samples cluster within ESIP. Uh, the session started with a presentation by Val Stanley, who discussed our motivations for creating a space dedicated to the needs of physical samples. In particular, this idea that we would benefit from a central location that we can discuss what's been done and what needs to be done moving forward without necessarily duplicating efforts or wasting resources. We had three breakout discussions during the session to evaluate if there was a need for a cluster to identify who would be the community this cluster might represent and what topics the community might address uh, moving forward. Uh, the key takeaways were that there was great support for proposing cluster, that we didn't even have to like debate it, it was great. Um, the cluster statement and the community, the draft that we had initially uh, described the geology community and that needed to be expanded to include other domains um, like biology and environmental science. And the final takeaway was that there were a number of broader communities around the glo globe that we need to coordinate with, such as Tadwig, RDA, Spinach, and ICOM. Uh, so, for example, within those communities, the Research Data Alliance has a physical samples and collections interest group. Uh, the interest group is hosting a session on harmonizing vocabularies at the next RDA plenary. And vocabulary is a hot topic in our session and at ESIP overall, as we saw in Leslie and Margaret's presentations. So we hope to develop connections with these different sample communities moving forward in order to coordinate and not, again, duplicate efforts. So uh, we're currently working on revising the cluster statement and we'll distribute that to the community in the, in the upcoming weeks. Because there's not yet a listserv for this community, um, if you'd like to take part in this review or even the community in general, um, please add your name to the session's note document and we'll use that as a list to distribute the cluster statement. Um, if you have any questions about the goals or objectives of the samples community or um, the, how the session went and want to talk about it more, you can contact me or Val. And um, that's all, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so last but very much not least, um, I'd like to welcome Karen Mo to discuss the public-private partnerships in the age of the COVID-19 global pandemic session. Thank you, Megan. So we've been a uh, cluster, the disasters life cycle cluster for a number of years. And uh, we have evolved to the point of really looking at this problem, how can we get uh, the data that's being developed by uh, agencies in particular and uh, and make them highly usable uh, with public and private sector partners in, um, in decision-making for disasters. And COVID-19 has certainly just added a whole layer of complexity uh, to the way that uh, uh, these disasters are, are, are being held, uh, handled. So we had these three takeaways uh, in our discussions, which included uh, presentations by uh, NASA, and uh, we had a presentation on cybersecurity and in, uh, in infrastructure security from DHS. Um, and we heard from the All Hazards Consortium, which is uh, partnering already with uh, federal and state, as well as private uh, companies uh, for, for handling a number of different types of disasters. And the idea of uh, this trust levels for data is, is just really critical. 
uh, there's been a lot of support for the operational readiness levels, which ESIP kind of rolled out um, a couple years ago. And uh, the All Hazards Consortium is developing mechanisms for uh, helping their, the community implement uh, those levels for their specific use cases. Private uh, public private coordination is uh, in, in focusing on the use cases to really identify uh, ways to more quickly um, get data in there to help them with their decision making. So we need to bridge that gap between um, agencies providing the data and, uh, and helping these end communities use that data properly. So in the next six months, we're really going to be looking at mechanisms to provide feedback to the agencies, because uh, when they know that uh, the community is benefiting uh, from uh, the uh, publicly uh, supported, taxpayer supported resources that uh, our satellites are producing, uh, that feedback is, is really critical. And there, there could be some give and take uh, from those who are using the data uh, to ways that that data then can be more uh, properly or, or conveniently uh, presented to people. So uh, we meet on the first Thursday of every month at four o'clock Eastern time. Uh, please join us. We're especially interested uh, in hearing about uh, products that can help uh, with the the whole life cycle of of disasters from uh prediction to uh, uh damage assessment and then the, the weather and, uh, and all kinds of steps in between so thank you thanks so much karen so this highlights webinar wouldn't be complete without uh, mentioning the always exciting funding friday so i'd like to welcome annie burgess to give a brief report out on that Hi, Megan. Thanks so much. So uh, before we get to the winners of Funding Friday, just an overview of how this uh, first virtual Funding Friday went. I would say broadly, um, as Aaron alluded to at the very beginning, that we were really excited to see the number of participants that showed up for Funding Friday. Um, we also had an event called First Friday because as the ESIT meeting was two weeks this year, we utilized that first Friday of the meeting as our idea sharing time and a time to explain uh, what the Funding Friday competition was. Um, and we had that along with the research showcase. And we also had great participation in those two events. So that first Friday, again, was used to um, do some idea sharing and encourage people to meet and create collaborative posters. And then the uh, second Friday of the ESIP summer meeting, which was the true funding Friday, uh, we used the Kiko chat space to uh, put everyone's poster in a different Kiko chat room, allowing participants to go between them and chat with the poster presenters. Again, trying to mimic that Friday morning when we're in person uh, while we have coffee and walk around and look at all the posters. Um, so again, we had uh, over 80 people show up. We had nine official submissions and you can see the winners here on the screen. We had two teachers and one student uh, win in the student teacher group and then three ESIP member prizes. And just a reminder that uh, each of those students or teachers received $3,000 and our member prizes were $5,000 each. Uh, and everyone will be presenting the results of their Funding Friday Award at the virtual winter meeting uh, in January. So overall, I would say it was a, a great success. And I think mostly it was that we were able to keep it uh, fairly light and lively and, uh, and have great participation from our wonderful community. So back to you, Megan. Thanks, Annie. So I'd like to suggest that we now take um, two minutes to head over to our document. Uh, since we don't have time for everybody to unmute and ask their questions, I think we should keep going with this document. There's a lot in it already, so you might want to just take a look at what others have written. Um, so, uh, presenters, there are some questions there that some of you I don't think have seen yet that you might want to address. 
And then in about two minutes, like I said, I will uh, wrap up with a couple of closing slides. All right, we will call that two minutes. This document is not going to be closed, so you can keep at it um, even once this webinar is finished. Uh, but I'd like to take a minute to just point out for those of you who may not be as familiar with ESIP, the many ways that you can jump in and get involved. You've heard so many of them today um, beyond just the twice yearly ESIP meetings. You're welcome to join one of the existing collaborations um, and we want you to feel like there's no need to RSVP, but just to see something happening and jump in and get involved. So we have the ESIP community calendar on our website that we invite you to take a look at and simply click to join. Um, you can consider applying for ESIP lab support. Uh, this isn't something we discussed too much on this call, but you did see that report out from, from Leslie. Um, and I'd like to reiterate that this is not just small grant funding, but really um, the lab helps projects by exposing and building collaborations around them and Annie Burgess, ESIP's lab director, is here to discuss that, um, encourage you to learn more. You can also encourage your organization to become an ESIP partner. Um, another thing I'd like to point out, thanks to Ben and Yuhan, um, you can encourage others or yourself to apply to be a, an ESIP community fellow. We think this is a really important opportunity. We, we get so much from our fellows. I've been amazed by what they've achieved and um, by just how, how helpful and how many ways they've really gotten involved in ESIP. So definitely check that out. Um, over the last 20 years, numerous people, 20 plus years, numerous people have contributed in numerous ways. And we invite you to contribute in the way that's most helpful to you. We thank you for what you've done so far and um, in advance for, for what else you will contribute. Um, before we close, I, I didn't want to skip this. I'd like to mention and say thank you to our very generous meeting sponsors, AGU, Element 84, Amazon Web Services, and Figshare. And finally, I'd say if you do just one thing, um, please subscribe to our ESIP Monday update mailing list. This is a great way to get one email a week um, compiled, a compilation of what's going, in, going on in and around ESIP. Uh, so with that, I'd like to bring our webinar to a close. Thank our speakers very much um, and our session leaders who really push the envelope, so to speak, um, by creating such excellent breakout sessions and uh, excellent report outs here today. And I want to thank everyone who joined um, and the whole team who presented. Uh, finally, a reminder that this webinar is recorded and will be posted on the ESIP YouTube channel shortly. Thank you, everyone.